blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. My Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His Spirit, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Thanksgiving song written by Fanny Crosby. She wrote the words and couldn't find a tune and Mr. Knapp came and saw her and said, well, here's, here's a tune that goes with your, with your poem, amen, and so it, it worked out. What a great uh, song of praise amen. and a, a, a catchy tune to go along with it and it's a wonderful time of the year to thank the Lord. We're always thankful as, as uh, everything, even our prayers are, are done with thanksgiving and as, as, as it's mentioned in every, nearly every prayer mentioned in the Bible has to do with praying with thanksgiving to the Lord and as we look at these things this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 4, you'll notice in your bulletin it says 1 through 16. But as I got into it, we'll be lucky if we get to verse 12, okay? So, so uh, we'll just read down through verse 12, and you can read the rest of the chapter if you like to, but uh, it, it's, it's a great chapter. And uh, as, we, as we see Paul giving Timothy great advice about, uh, and Paul had already given the, the, uh, the elders in Ephesus some advice in Acts chapter 20, we read it there, but, but uh, here we find him giving advice about these different things that he was confronted with, and uh, some of these things we're not confronted with, like the eating of meats and things like that. It's not an issue in our day, but it, it was in their day, but we have issues in our day. There's no question about it, and a lot of different things going on, and uh, I mean, every, every tweet, every single thing that has to do with anything is just a, 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 a big blow up, a big uh, a news thing, 
Uh, in fact, they even reported this morning on the news about uh, uh, Vice President Biden, Biden, you know, the former vice president, about him getting a dog, amen? So, so there's all kinds of news out there, all kinds of different things to, to talk about, to report, and, to, uh, and everything now has become a controversy. But you find when it comes to the Word of God, as it said in last week and uh, even this week, without controversy, these things are, are truths. And the, they're eternal truths, and they're helpful in any time period uh, of any, uh, any society, any particular uh, time frame or whatever. These things are very helpful and uh, beneficial to our Christian lives. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Boy, just let that soak in a minute, okay? Speaking lies in hypocrisy having their own conscience seared with a hot iron and forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. See, there's thanksgiving in this message right there. By those who believe and know the truth, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you've carefully followed. Verse 7 says, But reject profane and no wives' uh, fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're grateful for the great advice that Paul gave to Timothy, and Lord, we receive it also as advice to us individually and Lord, collectively as a group as well. We're thankful that, Lord, you have pre preserved your word. And, Lord, it's, it's very relevant. It's very helpful uh, in every kind of situation that we may be confronted with. Lord, we ask your blessings upon us now in Christ's name. Amen. So in giving uh, advice to Timothy, he's encouraging him to faithfulness in the face of great opposition. Paul addresses this in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, uh, well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But God's answer to opposition is almost always to uh, never to remove the hostility and antagonism, but uh, to give grace and to give uh, uh, strength during the midst of disparity and uh, opposition. And so this results in a philosophy of life and ministry that Paul had adopted, and uh, he was also passing on to Timothy. And that is uh, to uh, accept the situation as it is and continue to preach the truth, and especially it might seem like an oversimplification, but to just, Timothy, be an example. The, the, uh, understand that there's a lot of hypocrisy out there, there's a lot of falsehoods out there, but be an example uh, to these believers. And in, uh, we, you know, we long for, for uh, political freedom and social acceptance of our faith, but, but, uh, uh, and there's nothing wrong with yearning and even praying uh, for a, a liberty uh, to serve the Lord 
and to conduct our lives. In fact, Paul addresses this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And so uh, this thing with, with uh, uh, praying uh, for, for peace and, and praying with thanksgiving in our hearts and, and understanding that we live in the midst of a, a wicked, wicked generation. And some people think, oh, oh, it's just a terrible thing that we live in such a, a wicked uh, land. But we have to understand that even the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, uh, living in a, in a time period where uh, uh, people were persecuted greatly. And he was crucified. And he was crucified and did nothing but good. We, we uh, studied about it in Sunday school this morning. He, he went about healing people. I mean, how could you find anything wrong with anybody that was healing people? But they did. They, they, in fact, if he healed somebody on the Sabbath, they said, uh-huh, that's, that's, that's a no-no. You can't do that. You can't do good on the Sabbath day. And so uh, they, he had all kinds of opposition. And, of course, the first century church as well. And uh, what uh, uh, Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. And that uh, enabled the church to scatter abroad and to, uh, for the uh, gospel message to be spread abroad uh, as a result of that. And so uh, there's nothing wrong with praying uh, for uh, all situations and all in authority. In fact, we're commanded to do so. But uh, that being said, in Paul in chapter 4, speaks in, on how to live and how to minister in the midst of the realities of, uh, of false doctrine and wickedness. And there's a whole lot more to it than just cursing the darkness. The real answer is simply to exercise your talents. And he tells that uh, uh, to Timothy, the verses 13 and, and, and a following that we did not read. But he tells him to be an example and then to exercise those gifts, those uh, 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 talents that God had given him to the best of his ability, and to be an example to the believers. And so that's where we kind of begin this morning. We kind of lay that out as the foundation. Now he starts out in chapter 4 and verse number 1, that just something that just absolutely jumped off the page to me. He starts out by saying, Now the Spirit expressly says... Now, this grabs your attention because God's not just speaking. He's speaking expressly, and this is the only time in your Bible that this particular word is used. And so uh, it kind of draws some attention to it. He's speaking expressly. He's saying something very, very forcefully. And I just wanted to think about it just this morning. God does have a way of speaking to us individually in an express manner, doesn't he? God has a way of getting our attention. God has a way of speaking to us about some things. It may be through circumstances, and it may be times when you go through a circumstance and you open up your devotional book, or you're going through a circumstance and you hear a little message on the radio. You might even be going down the road. And, uh, and there's just something, uh, God is speaking to you about something, and then all of a sudden you look and you see a church sign, and it might have a little saying out there that just reaches out and grabs you. And this is what he's talking about here, that uh, God is speaking expressly in these latter times uh, concerning these things. And so uh, notice this places an emphasis of importance on the state of affairs in the latter times. It calls for Timothy and all who would follow the same uh, advice to have an understanding of the dangerous doctrines that would be pushed forward with certain rules, certain prohibitions, uh, certain things that will make it seem as if uh, they are the spiritual ones. And uh, uh, you hear it uh, 
from time to time. People uh, will, will have a political view and then they'll go to the scripture and they'll try to say, well, you know, Jesus said he, he, you're supposed to take care of the poor and so because of that, that means this particular policy should be, should be thrust forth because this is what Jesus said. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, amen. You can, you can pull a lot of things out of context. Uh, and, and so uh, D. James Kennedy said this. He said, you know, a lot of people are talking about tolerance. And here's what he said. Tolerance is the last virtue of a depraved society. He says, when you have an immoral society that has blatantly, proudly violated all the commandments of God, the one last virtue they insist upon is tolerance for their immorality. And that's exactly what we have before us today. Amen? And so the case in point in our time would be those that would claim a, have a, even a right to choose abortion. And if you disagree with them, they say, well, you're denying them a freedom. Uh, they say that that's our constitutional right to uh, 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 kill a baby. And, and uh, so uh, it's this crowd that talks about uh, how they're for the children, and yet they're, they're killing the children. And so uh, that's this hypocrisy that he's talking about, a classic example of our text, departing from the faith and speaking lies in hypocrisy. And it's more common than you think, even in religious circles. I, I get all kinds of different um, uh, publications, religious publications. And more and more common now, Every, every major election, and they didn't send it on this midterm election, but every major election, and I kind of expected it on this one. There's an organization that uh, sends this real, real uh, 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 official-looking uh, uh, letter with a letterhead, and it's from Washington, D.C. I remember as a young pastor when I first got that, I've been getting this letter every major election since the 1980s, okay? And, and, and so uh, a real official looking from Washington, D.C., and I thought, wow, here, here's a letter uh, addressed to little old me from Washington, D.C. It must be important. And so I opened up the letter, and it's, got, it's even got a little American flag on it. And I thought, okay, here's, here's something with an American flag on it. And so and then uh, it goes on and, and, and it sternly warns that if you make any kind of political statements in your pulpit, that uh, we're going to come after you and get the IRS on you and, and uh, take away your, your uh, uh, 501c3 status and you, you'll no longer be tax exempt and all this, that, and the other and all kinds of uh, warnings about that. You know, if you say anything that's political, well, everything's political speech now. Amen. Uh, I, in fact, I used to have great uh, debates with my dad. My dad was an older man. He was 40 when I was born, and so when I was in my teenage years, he was uh, on up in his 50s, and, and um, we used to uh, have great political discussions and debates in our house. I would, uh, uh, my work schedule was in such a way where, where I was working in the evenings as he was, and my mom would be gone in the mornings many times. She would be doing church work and different things with the uh, ladies' groups. And, and so I would fix my dad some breakfast in the, in the mornings. And uh, uh, me and him would have great political discussions. And uh, I thought that, that was some 50 years ago. Now, uh, if I could have, uh, he would turn over in his grave if he would know where we are politically these days. Amen? What political discussions we would have. Who would have ever dreamed that ice cream would be making a political statement, amen? Ice cream. I mean, you ought to just be able to go and buy ice cream and enjoy ice cream. It ought not to have anything political about coffee. Coffee has, uh, on both sides of the aisle, has, has political statements, amen? Uh, uh, clothing. I, I spoke at the school in the, in the late spring, this uh, uh, last late spring, and I spoke at the school, and um, uh, we were outside the school waiting on them to open up the learning center uh, so we could get in, and I had to sign in and all this, that, and the other, and we were waiting, and, 
it was already 80 something degrees at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. It was, it was, it was getting warm. And uh, I, I, I could not understand. There were several students there that had on sweatshirts with hoodies. And I, I didn't know that it was a political thing. I thought, if, if you're cold, you need a sweatshirt. And if you're really cold, you need a hoodie to, you know, to bundle up because it's cold. But it's 80 degrees out there, okay, at 7 o'clock in the morning. And they were sitting there just sweat pouring off of them, complaining that they wouldn't open the door for them because they were just so hot. And I said, well, just take your sweatshirt off. And they looked at me like, well, what in the world? <laughs> take your sweatshirt off. It's a, because why? They're making a political statement with their little sweatshirt on. I said, well, go on and make your political statement. Be hot. I don't care, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, but who would have dreamed? We live in a day uh, where any kind of statement can be uh, taken. Uh, Nathan said something about, well, actually, he didn't say it. The little girl said it, and he just agreed, nodded, said, yeah, that's what you need to do. But if you, if you pick cotton, then that's, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. You know, you, you can't say that to somebody about picking cotton. They, they can't do that. You, that's a political statement. And so uh, all these different things, I, and you say, Bridger, are, are you getting off, off the wall here? No, I, I'm, I'm making a, a point here about what he's talking about, these old wives' tales and uh, all these uh, different uh, things and statements, and uh, they're energized by Satan. Now, Paul had previously warned the Ephesian elders that false doctrine would invade the church in Acts chapter 20. I want to start reading at verse 28. He said, therefore, take heed to yourselves... And to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So in a similar way, he's talking to the elders at Ephesus. And then later on, as in our text, he's talking to Timothy, who is now pastoring uh, this church at Ephesus. Verse 29 says, For I know this, that after my departure... Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among uh, yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, once again, he's having to warn Timothy about these same savage wolves that are coming in to distort everything. And so we find that they're energized by Satan. He, he, he warns against the false doctrine that it originates from Satan. He says these teachings of Satan are deceiving. And we find that uh, uh, they lead people astray. He says that some will depart from the faith. They were turning people away from the truth of the gospel. And then uh, he was saying they were hypocrites. And of course, you find the hypocrisy uh, uh, in so many different areas today. And so one of the marks of a true servant of God is honesty and integrity. False teachers are not just wrong doctrinally. They're also wrong morally. And uh, the answer to false teaching is truth that's coupled with godliness and of the truth of God lived as an example. And that's exactly the uh, advice that it was given to Timothy. So truth of doctrine along with godliness of our conduct is woven throughout this passage as well as many other places as the answer to the hypocrisy and falsehoods of any time or any culture that we may be confronted with. Now, doctrinally, some people may be as sound or straight as a gun barrel, but empty and without power, and it's of no effective use. And so we have to make sure we have, uh, that we worship him. Uh, it's true in our worship, even it says that uh, those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. I never will forget as a young minister, Someone explained this in a great way. I think that's tremendous. Some people, they, they major in their lives on the spirit aspect of things. They say, well, you know, we're not going to worry about the truth. We don't want to teach doctrine. We just want to major on the spirit. 
And then there's other people in their ministry, they major uh, just on the truth, and they say, well, we, we don't want to have anything to do with the Spirit. But you see, you have to understand, it's the Spirit and the truth coupled together that empowers it uh, to be effective in our lives and in our ministry. And so Paul is tell, telling Timothy, first of all, uh, to, as he warned the Ephesian elders, now he's, uh, he's telling Timothy to be faithful in giving this instruction, which is consistent to what he had previously given to the elders in Ephesus. He says in verse 6 of our text, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith, and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. So there's three things that he tells Timothy in the verses that follow. He tells him to avoid the bad things. He tells him not to major on the temporary things. And then to embrace the eternal. And that's where we'll get down to verse 12 in just a few moments. So first of all, verse 7, avoiding the bad. He says, but reject profane and wise fables. And exercise yourself toward godliness. Now, there's all kinds of fables and sayings that have no basis in Scripture. There must have been a real problem in that culture because Paul had warned even Titus about Jewish fables in Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. Again, he warned Timothy about these same uh, fables that he's talking about here in 2 Timothy, in his second letter. So it must have been an ongoing thing, and, and rightfully so. You have to understand, at this particular time, they, did, they had the Old Testament scriptures, and the New Testament was just now being formulated with the uh, letters that Paul was writing to the various churches and this, that, and the other. And so uh, this is why it was so necessary for Paul to talk to Timothy to, uh, to tell him these things of importance and then for Timothy then to follow suit in telling the people the, the right doctrine of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find that uh, his writings to Timothy was by extension. And then as later on the word of God came together and we have the collection of the 66 books, the 27 books of the New Testament. And, and we uh, come together and we bring all these things and correlate them together and understand that, uh, that these things balance out and we uh, understand that uh, God has a lot to say to us. I don't think we need extra biblical things. There's uh, enough right here to keep us busy the rest of our lives, amen, uh, to keep us studying and, and uh, wondering and praying and, and digging and, and uh, uh, applying uh, these marvelous truths that God has us. For us, And so he tells us to avoid the bad, to reject the profane and fables. And then he says the antidote to that is to exercise ourselves toward godliness. Now, that bringing up the subject of exercise, then he says in verse 8, do not major on the temporary things. In verse 8, he says bodily exercise profits a little. But, uh, God, uh, but uh, godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. Now you just take that first phrase, bodily exercise profits just a little. Amen. I had a, a preacher friend of mine well, years ago, great big guy. He didn't believe in exercise, and he, that was his favorite verse. Amen. <laughs> bodily exercise profits little. Okay? That was his verse. You know, but uh, but you have to understand he's not he's not saying it's wrong uh, for to exercise your body to take good care of your body. He's just saying that's temporary. You have to understand that a godliness is the is the greater exercise. That's the the thing that you're to major on, and uh, and I think you know you can take any portion of scripture you would like to. And you could uh, uh, say, well, uh, this means this, and, and then that way that, that means you're not to do this. And so uh, as he understands, uh, you can take even some of the writings of Paul. Remember, it says it up in here in the verses previous, 
we read it says the forbidding to marry, and, and Paul talks about marriage and how that uh, uh, it, it's good to remain single if, if possible. And, and boy, you could, you could take that and, and work it out and rest the scriptures out and wrangle them out to a certain degree. But he's saying here that it's, it's wrong for them to forbid to marry. And, and so uh, understanding of the, the scriptures in total. And so he's saying, avoid the bad, do not major on the temporary things. And then he's saying, embrace the eternal. And that's where you place your priorities and principles. That's where you come to the fact of, of exercising yourself toward godliness. And so in the verses that follows, he continues to tell Timothy how to be this kind of example. And that's where we come into uh, these different things that he mentions, verses 12 and uh, 13. Well, verse 12 especially, it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so that's as far as we'll get this morning. So by being a godly example, it will be a, he'll be able, uh, he says, Let no one despise your youth. Now, this is how you're an overcomer in any particular uh, situation. They could uh, point to uh, Timothy and say, well, you're just a young whippersnapper. You don't have uh, the, 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 uh, 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 you know, the wisdom and, and the knowledge and the understanding that we have. These, uh, these Ephesian elders, uh, uh, they, they could have said that. I said, you know, you're just, you're just young. But here is how that Timothy was going to overcome these things by being a great example in these different areas. And so, first of all, it talks about in word. Now, our speech should always be honest and loving. And we're told in Ephesians 4.15, speaking uh, uh, the truth in love. And, of course, this is a, a charge that was given to Timothy and, of course, to all of us, for that matter. And so, uh, but I believe also it's talking about uh, the Word of God as well, that uh, Timothy was to be well-versed in the Scriptures. You say, well, preacher, you just told us that they didn't have much of the New Testament at this time. No, they didn't. But they did have the Old Testament. They had these letters from Paul uh, that Paul had written. Uh, no doubt uh, Timothy had the, the letter that uh, Paul had written to Ephesus at this time and others. And so uh, we find that uh, in, in understanding these words and understanding these, these great principles uh, to be an example in, in word. And then also in conduct. The old King James says indeed, in word and in deed. And so in conduct, this is right away as a contrast to the hypocrisy that he spoke of earlier in those that teach false doctrine. He says uh, uh, the, the, the way to be an overcomer in that is in word and in deed. Uh, when you find that they're working together, they, they, they show a, a parallel, those parallel truths. What you say and what you do when they're consistent with one another and consistent with the word of God. Now here's the, 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 the key. And no one's perfect. No one is able to, to uh, uh, exactly uh, uh, go down the road. You know, it's kind of like you have a car nowadays. My car doesn't do this. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't purchase all that. But, but, uh, but you have a car these days that if you get outside of the lines, it beeps at you. And all this, that, and that. A lot of you have cars that do that. Amen. And listen, nobody's perfect. And especially if I had one of them cars, it'd be beeping at me all the time. Amen. I'd be, you know, so, so uh, nobody's perfect. And so, uh, but, but here's guidelines. It's kind of the same thing. The Word of God provides us with these guidelines, these, these lights and bells and whistles that go off if we get outside of the, of, of the guidelines, uh, outside of the lane. And so he's saying in word and in conduct, uh, you do these things and, and it, it keeps you inside the guidelines uh, of, of where you're to be. And then, of course, there's other issues, but uh, notice in love he talks about. Now that points out the motivation of our lives. If we love God and we love other people, 
we will be effective and, uh, and it will be also very evident in our lives. In fact, people say it, it, it doesn't matter to people how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen? And if they know how much you care, then, then that's all that really matters. And so that's in love. That, that, that points out the motivation of our lives. And then in spirit, and we talked about that. In spirit. Now this implies an inner enthusiasm and excitement. Being able to serve God and others. A willingness to do ministry. To fulfill a purpose and to be used by God. And that's of course was one that uh, Timothy was one that was willing to be used. And, uh, and Paul encouraged him in regards to this. In spirit. And also in faith, it talks about in faith, and this includes the fact that we trust in God, not only in a personal way for our, our personal lives, but we trust in God uh, for the church. It's amazing to me. It's always been a, a, just a, a marvelous thing to me to observe a church, not as individuals that are coming together just to, uh, to meet together, but to observe a church as a body of believers and to see God working with that live body as he is the head of the body and to do it in faith and to see God working in regards to the, the, the decisions they make, the, the things that they do, the outreaches they have. And, and, and it's just a marvelous thing to me. And to kind of sat, step back and, and observe uh, this is a work of God. This isn't just a community organization is what I'm trying to say. Amen? Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this isn't just uh, uh, people coming together. Uh, listen, truth be known, as uh, independent and as stubborn as we all are individually, amen, it's an absolute miracle. The, the, uh, the um, uh, unity and the sweetness that we have. And the reason why is because we're yielding uh, to one another as we yield to the Lord and recognize him as our head. And that's important. And so we do this in faith. And then lastly, in purity. Now this is very, very, very important. The purity has to do with the mind, the body, the motives behind the things we do. Uh, that thing of purity has just always been uh, 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 something that uh, I've, I've uh, uh, prayed to the Lord about. I, I was really, really concerned as a young minister, as Timothy was a young minister. And Paul gave him this, this advice about purity. And I, I was concerned. I went to my pastor in Tennessee. I, I said, listen, I, I said, uh, all, these, all these great uh, guys are, are great preachers. I said, they're falling like flies. They're going into immorality. And I said, I'm, I'm a weak person. I, I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of faults and failures. And how am I going to, to be able to stand? If they fall, how could I possibly stand? He said, listen, let me tell you something. He says, it starts up here in the mind, the purity. You keep it pure up here, then you don't have to worry about it. And so I got to thinking about that. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't wake up this morning thinking, okay, I, I think I'll go rob a bank and this is how I'm going to do it. No, I, I didn't mull that over in my mind. I don't even think about that. And so uh, it, it's the things that we think about and dwell upon are the things that we eventually find ourselves struggling to do and so, uh, or not to do. And so with that in mind, purity is very important. And it's the, it's the grand conclusion to a ministry. If there's no purity, there's no example. It nullifies the, the truth that we talked about earlier. It nullifies everything else. If, if, if we don't have the purity, the good deeds that, that follow uh, the ministry. And that's very, very important. And so we understand that, that God has given the pathway the guideline, so to speak. He's the one that originated the, the first vehicle with the, with the things of staying in the guidelines of the lanes. Amen? We, man, we, we, we think we're pretty smart these days. Yeah, we've invented a car now that will park itself, that will just about drive itself. Some of these cars drive themselves now, just about. I mean, they, they stay in the lane, and they stop if you come upon something, and 
And they do all these different things, and you say, well, preacher, I think your wife would say you need that. Amen. <laughs> I probably need that. But, but listen, uh, we, we think we're pretty smart, but God, long, long time ago, gave us the guidelines to stay in the lanes. Amen. Amen. And aren't you glad he has done so? He's given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Let us stand together. Our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon us, Lord, and we may understand and know, Lord, what you have for us as your people. Lord, if, we, if we've never accepted you as our Savior, Lord, now is the time. You say now is the accepted time, Lord, to come to trust you as, as our Savior. Lord, as we've seen this last week, we, we may be young, we may be old, but Lord, we don't know how much time we have. Any of us could go at any moment. Lord, help us to realize that and to understand that our relationship with you is paramount. And Lord, help us to make sure that we have a relationship with you this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What number, brother? Number 312, softly and tenderly. 312, as we sing together, do not leave this building today without settling your relationship with the Lord. It's that important. <coughs> it is that important. You go on a call like we did yesterday morning, you think it's important. It's important that you settle this between your relationship between you and the Lord. While we sing, you come this morning. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is called. time, if you sp feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, you might say, well, preacher, I, I just, I just, too uncomfortable to come forward. You come, you call me. Day or night, it doesn't make any difference. Get this thing settled. It's not just a fact of living in the right guidelines. It's a fact of having the relationship. You have to have the vehicle first. Amen. You have to have the relationship first. And then then you can worry about the guidelines, amen? But God, God, God will give you grace to stay in the guidelines, at least somewhat, amen? Amen, and, and as, as good as possible that, that it's necessary to do, amen? God, God will give you the grace. And so uh, God bless you. It's good to, good to have Joe Jocelyn with us. Joe, could you lead us to the Lord in prayer and dismiss us, please? Amen. Yeah. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right, I forgot. Okay, y'all be seated for a minute, and then we'll be dismissed, okay? We're going to do the vote on the uh, uh, budget. All right, and so um, we need a motion and a second. Oh, we don't. We don't. Oh, it comes from the committee. That's right. That's so we need no motion or second. All right. All in favor, say Amen. amen.
Any opposed, say aye. And of course there's none. All right. God bless you. All right. Now we need a motion and a, uh, and a second that we adjourn the business. I make a motion. Okay. Ed does that. And uh, Fred Collins uh, seconds that. Those that's taken the notes. Okay. Uh, Fred Collins second that. Ed made the motion. All right. All in favor, stand to your feet and we'll be dismissed in prayer at this time. All right. We appreciate the, uh, the um, seem like every year we increase our mission giving and every year the Lord blesses us in a tremendous, tremendous way as a result of that. Okay. Yeah, J Jerry was good about handing them out while y'all were.